I get out of this little Merc this old Mercury half ton truck with about, I don't know, ten bags of dirt in the back to try to keep the back end down. Uh, he took a run at this hill and we got, you know, as we're going up the trucks fishtailing and we're going back and forth, my brother and I are saying, Oh Dad, you can make it, you can make it. <laughs> he actually just barely made it up the hill. We got home about quarter to twelve and we were in bed by twelve o'clock and I'm sure I was asleep as soon as I hit the covers and Santa came. It was so enjoyable. We got up the next morning, there was stockings full and Santa brought his gifts, etc., etc. But that was the year that Christmas almost didn't come for Jeff and I. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, thank you, Marilyn, do you have a remembrance? Uh, yeah, we have a, well, one is um, Christmas morning in 19, I'm dating myself, 1956, we were living in Cold Lake, Alberta. We got up and uh, my mom was not home, but there was a little baby under the Christmas tree in the bassinet, and mama was in the kitchen making our breakfast. She had given birth to my, our youngest sister on December the 20th, and there was a surprise that they were home from the hospital and there was a little baby under the tree. So, uh, yeah, that was pretty special. We do have another family tradition that the baby born that year, whatever year, the first baby, always gets a Christmas stocking made by somebody in our family for their first Christmas. And I have mine that was given to me by my grandparents um, in 1947, dating myself. I still have it and still hang it up. We all do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Susan. Once yeah. I have mute. Uh, I think this is a Christmas that almost <coughs> didn't happen as well, much like Larry's. I used to always drive from Morrisburg, we lived in Morrisburg, down to London, Ontario. My parents lived just outside of London, Ontario. And uh, we we would always meet. Now I had children at that point. I had three children. My sister had three children. And she lived uh, just south of London. So what we would do is we would, uh, some of the people would stay at my, my sister's and some would stay at my mom's. But Christmas Eve, everybody would get together and we'd all sleep there. So Christmas morning, everybody was home and we all could or my parents' home, and we could all open the stockings and do the usual Christmas thing. So uh, all the presents, when we arrived, all the presents were left at my parents, and I went down to my sister's that, that day and uh, with uh, the three of my children, and because she has her three children, they get along really well, they're all the same age. And uh, so we're busy doing our stuff Christmas Eve day, and um, we thought we'd better get in the car and get home to get the kids back in bed. And the huge snow, belt. now we're south of London, it was gorgeous and green. London, my parents lived in the snow belt, just got a whiteout that you could not believe and nobody was traveling. So we started to sort of come back and we got to an impasse of snow and thought, there's no way we're gonna get there for Christmas Eve. And so we had to turn around and come back to my sisters and, uh, all the, uh, remember all the gifts, all the stocking stuff, or everything is at my mother's. So we went and put the kids to bed. My sister and I began to go through the house and find oranges and um, little craft stuff. And we had six stockings full of the most delightful Christmas presents, or little gifts. And the next morning they got up and they got their stockings and we told them, and they had lovely stuff. And then we went back to my mother's where all the gifts were because the snow clouds have gone through at that point. But I think what it taught us is that it doesn't matter what you spend or how much effort you put into the gifts because we threw this stuff together in an hour, one evening with no stores open. And the kids probably remember that Christmas more than they remember the Christmases that they got all the wonderful gifts. And I think if everyone thinks back on their Christmases, it's not what they got or what they gave, it's the memories, the, the feelings, the, the just the joy of being with your family, and uh, you know, just everything like that. That really, really, really is in your mind. 
So Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you, Susan. Pierre, do you, do you have your hand up? No. No? Don? Anyone else? I just have one to the I can't say it. it's not a story. We don't have enough. We're not here until noon. So, uh, but it is from Doug Beatty. I was talking to Doug Monday night. He had the operation <coughs> on his knee uh, Monday morning. Uh, and he asked me to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and all the best in the new year. So I was quite surprised. Usually you're a little, little queasy after an operation, but uh, I had to ask him if he'd even had it yet. So he's doing very well, and he's home today, by the way. Good. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Good. Hey, you go. Okay. Yeah. Hey, good. I, got, I got a story. Oh, Tim. Oh, yeah. go ahead, Tim. If you want to hear it. Yeah, go ahead, please. So. At, at the first, I didn't think I had a story. I couldn't remember anything. And then I started remembering stuff as everyone told their story. And um, I thought it would be appropriate to share a story about a Christmas that isn't going to happen. <laughs> now, this is really heavy. So, we've been getting ready for Christmas probably for about a month now. We've actually got gifts and everything for a lot of people, which is pretty cool. We even put a tree up this year. So, I thought... Let's go and visit some family that we haven't seen in like 40 years. Let's go to California. <laughs> so we started planning to get away two weeks ago to go to California. So we got to find out what the tickets were. It's actually, you can fly into California. So I thought, well, so my, uh, my cousin, I said, we're coming. Does that offer still stand? Because we had like a little chat and then nothing. It was like he was a ghost. He like disappeared. So I thought, well, that's one of those things where, you know, you get invited and you, <laughs> you're really not invited. So anyway, I, I let it set for about a, five days. And I called my sister. I said, what's their phone number? They haven't been calling me back. So I got all their numbers. And then I started um, calling. I started with the youngest. So I talked to my, my, um, my she'd be my, my cousin Francine. So these cousins would come to Canada once a year, yeah, usually in the summertime. We had big reunions. It was a big deal. And they have incredible uh, memories of visiting us. So we, got, we, we just picked up where we left off 40 years ago. So I said, I want to come and see Aunt June before she dies because she's like 90 years old. This is when we got to go. So that's like my driving factor. She says, well, they're not seeing anybody. You might be able to see them at the end of the driveway. I said, well... I guess we'll work with that. Let's see. We'll be down on the 23rd if everything works out. Better call him first. So I call my, my other cousin, Tony. He doesn't pick up. My, she doesn't even know his phone number, so she has to give him somebody else's phone number to call me. He's like, they're really close. So then I called my Aunt June. I'm on the phone with Aunt June, and I'm getting a call from Tony. So well, he can wait. So I'm talk, catching up with Aunt June. It's been 40 years, right? So... I won't go into the whole conversation because I, I know so I, <laughs> Brent's got to want to draw some lines on a map. <laughs> so anyway, Ed graciously left some space for me in the program. So anyway, I'm telling, I'm talking with her, catching up a little bit. And I says, Aunt June, guess what? We're making plans to visit you for Christmas. I says, we're going to have a tailgate party at the end of your laneway. And what do you think? So it's silent for like a little bit, but that long. And she says, no, you're not coming. You can't come here. I have, an eight, I have a grandson who drives an 18-wheeler. He's not allowed to come here. So if you come here, it ain't happening. You're not allowed. Come when I can come. You can come stay in our house and have a big hug and all that sort of stuff. So I said, okay, I'm glad I'm checking in because like, you're the reason I want to come there. I said, are you in good health? Oh, yeah, we're fine. We're 90 now and we're in good health. And, you know, we haven't been off our property since March. First time we tried, someone stole uh, Phil's uh, car. So, like, <laughs> things are a little rough in California, apparently. <laughs> so, anyway, then I call back my, my cousin, Anthony, Tony, and we catch up. And he re has memories of one day he was helping my dad and a bolt of lightning came through the barn and it blew up a kerosene lamp. And I guess there was flames everywhere. So just the, the sound of my voice triggered that kind of memory in my cousin. So that's pretty powerful. <laughs> pretty powerful voice here, guys. So anyway, and girls. Anyway, so we had a nice little reunion. 
So we resolved that we were not going to go to California. So we're heartbroken. And um, it was good timing. You know, we would have went into isolation and all that good stuff. But anyway, and we're not going to be able to do a real Hotel California or anything like that. But we do have a standing uh, ovation, a standing invitation to stay in Hammett, California. And I got the pine cone that I got from my grandpa when I was 14 on the shelf in the office. So anyway, that's the Christmas that didn't happen, but it's been kind of fun telling the, the story. And Tim gets a prize for the longest story. All right. Imagine Tim being isolated. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Okay, um, oh, I got a so I want to wrap you. up here. I just have a couple of important things I want to do with everybody before you um, you bow out. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Bonnie and Doug for what they've done to organize this this morning. Round of applause. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Ed, would you do me a favor? Would you go get Kelly? And yeah. the cook I said before was Debbie, but it's actually Mike. Mike's been doing our meals.